Okay, good afternoon. I believe that we can start. Uh, I am Alessandro Cianchi from the University of Rome Tor Vergata and I will chair this afternoon session. Um, focus on transverse profile and emittance monitor. So the first speaker is uh, Alessandro Kohler. Uh, Alexander had worked uh, at Helmut Centrum Dresden Rosendorf in Dresden for uh, eight and a half years. And there he obtained his PhD degree three years ago for investigating the transverse dynam dynamics of nanocoulomb electron bunches in a laser plasma accelerator. Now he's working on free space communication with laser at the Responsive Space Cluster Competence Center. Please, Alessandro. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here uh, in front of you and to present um, this um, talk here. So today I will talk about um, laser plasma acceleration of um, electrons and um, basically uh, about the transfer dynamics of these accelerated electron bunches inside the plasma. Um, if you are uh, wondering why um, basically I put here previously at Helmholtz Centrum Dresden Rothendorf, so um, I recently switched um, from there to um, the German Aerospace Center and um, the talk I will um, give um, here is basically more about uh, the topic I have worked there and um, not at the um, DLR. So this is a brief outline of my talk. Um, first, I will talk about um, laser wakefield acceleration and um, try to motivate it and uh, explain the mechanism behind it. And um, then I will show a typical setup and um, some, um, including some diagnostics used for that. I will spend basically the most time of the talk on these um, two points. Then I will briefly um, uh, talk about um, beta decoherence and also give um, like um, um, indications uh, or we'll also show um, um, light sources from um, laser wake field ele accelerated electrons like typical uh, beta radiation and uh, finally I will um, conclude my talk. So uh, I guess we have all um, seen today and um, yesterday and we already know them before um, these accelerators here like um, the um, LHC and uh, the Urum X file. And um, we all know that they are um, really big machines. And um, the reason why this is, is basically a structure um, looking like this. Yeah, looking like this, which is, um, um, as you can see, has a typical size, which cannot be made uh, smaller. And the reason is that um, if you would make it this smaller, you would create a discharge internal in this device and um, this would produce a plasma and um, this uh, accelerating structure will be uh, destroyed at the end. So why uh, don't use a plasma as an acceleration medium instead? So this is the idea behind laser plasma acceleration. So here you see um, two typical configurations or targets for laser wake field acceleration. The, the top one, on the top one you see um, um, plasma capillaries and the left one you see basically um, a one that is um, doing its operation. So uh, and on the left side you see basically like the typical sizes like this one here is like 10 centimeter in size and this one in length, sorry, uh, and this one is about 30 centimeter long. And with these devices you can reach electron energies up to um, 8 GeV. And uh, another typical target is a gas jet, typically like millimeters um, in size, where you um, focus your laser um, beam onto this gas jet, and inside this gas jet, you're accelerating the electrons, and um, at the plasma exit, you get basically the accelerated electrons and um, X-ray radiation or beta radiation. Okay, and um, so basically, how does it work, a laser wake field accelerator? I mean, first of all, you need a medium, which is a plasma, which is consisting of electrons and ions. Um, the ions are uh, much heavier, so um, they are not at 
will not taking um, part on the interaction on the time scale we are looking at. The electrons will react with the plasma density, uh, with the plasma frequency, and um, yeah. So this is typically a neutral uh, plasma with a density of up to um, 10 to the 19 electrons per um, cubic centimeter. And um, so this plasma then is uh, uh, the laser beam propagating, as shown here from the left to the right. And this um, laser beam has a ponderomotive force. This ponderomotive force uh, pushes electrons from a region of high intensities. So basically these electrons will be pushed away from the axis, like here, up and down. Uh, oh, sorry. Like up and down, and um, then these electrons will uh, be pulled back by the Coulomb field of the um, uh, plasma, and then perform plasma oscillations, which then will um, create uh, the plasma waves. If you are entering the nonlinear uh, regime, so having high laser, high intense laser pulses here, then um, the ponderative force will be um, so strong that um, all electrons will be pushed out of this um, region and um, you will have an um, electron free area behind um, um, the laser here in the Swedish area. Basically, um, this will be um, your plasma cavity or um, also called the uh, so called bubble. And um, in this plasma cavity, you have uh, electromagnetic fields from the plasma, which can be separated in two um, 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 fields. So um, the first, or two components, sorry. So the one component will be longitudinal on axis, so um, um, like um, this force here, which basically accelerated electrons, and um, so these electrons will gain a certain uh, energy of, um, uh, will gain a relativistic energy. And electrons that are basically somehow um, off axis, so basically in the transverse um, uh, dimension of this accelerator, they will be, they will feel um, a focusing force that pushes the electron back, and so these electrons will perform beta tron oscillation along the acceleration process. So um, this happens during the acceleration process. At the same time, we will have acceleration and focusing. That means um, you have both components all the time. And so the critical part here now is to um, uh, have electrons inside, um, to get electrons inside this cavity. The most simplest way on the paper would be to use an electron bunch externally and inject it on the, on the end of the cavity. Um, on the paper, actually only because it's um, a really great challenge to, um, to match all beam parameters into this uh, small um, 10, 20, uh, 20 micron big um, cavity. And um, so that's why there are also different uh, injection schemes, like one would be wave breaking or also ionization injection. And um, so the, the last one I will um, now basically try to explain. So for ionization injection, you basically need, um, again, a, a easy to ionize um, gas to have the plasma background electrons. And you will um, dope this gas with a, uh, a different gas, um, which has um, electrons on the K-shell, which has a higher intensity um, threshold for ionization. And so, um, so typically you would use um, a gas mixture of helium with nitrogen, where basically nitrogen has electrons on the K-shell, which um, are only ionized at the peak intensity of the laser pulse. Um, if you would just take this gas, that means that basically as long as your laser is uh, focused in the plasma, it will inject electrons. So you will have a continuous injection, and um, this basically would lead to a, um, a large um, energy spread of your accelerated electrons. So um, that's why you have to basically truncate uh, this injection process. <clears throat> and um, this can be done 
uh, when you're basically um, entering the plasma with a non-matched um, laser pulse. So basically, your laser pulse is um, evolving during the acceleration process. That means that also the driven uh, wake field is changing its um, shape and size. And that means that basically um, that you have to fulfill um, the, um, the so-called total potential um, differential threshold where you basically um, inject electrons in the front, um, maybe in the front of the cavity, and then these electrons are gaining energy until reaching the end of the cavity. And when they have reached the cavity, at the end of the cavity, the energy is enough to, um, to be trapped in the cavity and basically are um, accelerated further in the cavity. If this is not the case, these electrons will basically be um, lost and will be not accelerated anymore. So this is shown by the plot here on the bottom. And um, so what are the limits of um, laser wake field acceleration? I mean, you have three factors. The first factor is coming from the laser, where um, you need basically a laser um, pulse that um, uh, stays um, at its highest density over the um, distance of your plasma channel. Typically, a laser pulse will diffract. This is typically in the range of the Rayleigh, wavelength, uh, Rayleigh length, sorry. And, and this is, well, typically less than a millimeter. So you have to rely on um, either external guiding, that means you have your plasma channel where laser is guided, um, formed in such a um, way that um, the laser is um, contained along um, the plasma channel. Or you can also um, use relativistic self-focusing, where basically intensity of the laser pulse is um, so strong um, that um, the laser pulse is still um, counteracting the diffracting when it's uh, focused in uh, the plasma channel. Um, the second important parameter is the depletion of the laser, uh, which means basically if your laser is driving the plasma cavity, it transfers energy. So you transfer energy from the laser pulse to the wake. And um, the energy of the um, laser pulse is limit, it's limited, and when you have transferred all of the energy of the laser pulse to the wake, there is no, um, there is no energy in the laser pulse anymore, and um, it will basically diffract then at the end. And then um, the last factor is the phasing of the electrons, um, which is only um, uh, relevant if you have a laser pulse for um, driving your cavity. If you have, let's say, um, electrons for driving your cavity, then this is not uh, that um, crucial. Um, that means that basically your laser pulse is traveling, uh, traveling with um, a certain velocity in the plasma, which is um, shorter than the, um, uh, smaller than the speed of light. And your electrons are also traveling with a um, speed which is close to the speed of light. And at some point, um, these electrons will overtake the laser pulse and um, entering from the accelerating phase into the de-accelerating phase. And then, um, yeah, the acceleration process is stopped, basically. So in the idle, um, in the um, optimal performance, you would basically match the last two parameters, like the def uh, depletion and the defacing, and um, to have the optimal uh, energy um, transferred and the highest electron energy. And um, you also will rely on um, some uh, kind of guiding mechanism. With this, um, the question is now how, um, I mean, what um, beam parameters has been um, achieved with laser wake field acceleration. So I made here a little list and I will pick out um, three um, um, points of them. The first one is basically the electron energy which is, um, it has been shown here on the bottom, you see the electron spectrum. Here, so this is the electron spectrum of um, um, electrons accelerated up to 8 GB. And um, these have been accelerated with a device, uh, as I've shown you before, with is only a uh, three centimeter in length. And, um, the left um, figure here is just a zoom in and um, from the, um, this part here of the spectrum. And just intensify to see basically the, um, the bunch here in the, um, the region. Another um, critical parameter that has been reached is the, um, the um, 
um, the shot to shot stability. So here on the left side you see um, the electron spectrum on the, um, the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis um, are um, 100,000 uh, consecutive shots. Basically um, the laser system run over the all um, time without any outtake as you can see and um, you see also that the energy um, is um, well um, is well stabilized. On the bottom um, plot you basically see the divergence of the, uh, the sorry, the energy um, deviation and um, you see this is always um, close to zero. And quite recently it has been uh, achieved that um, Wakefield accelerated electrons are also able to uh, show free electron laser as you see here on the um, bottom right. Which is basically here is the, um, the spectrum of um, six shots from the FEL. So um, you see the intensity and the wavelength around, 200, uh, around um, 27 nanometers and on the right side you basically see um, the electron spectrum of these um, belonging shots by the energy axis is on the horizontal axis. So with this I will come now um, to um, the diagnostics and the setups. So a typical setup you would need like a high power laser system which has like um, 30 to um, maybe up to 100 femtoseconds uh, pulse width and um, has up to um, at, have at least um, one joule of energy in one pulse. This um, laser beam will be focused very tightly to 10, 20 micron and spot size with um, focusing optics and the critical part here is actually that you need um, for a stable operate, uh, operation of your accelerator you need um, a good um, profile of the laser beam which is characterized by the uh, stralias of the, the beam. As targets, uh, as I've shown you before, um, you would use um, gas jets or um, gas capillaries and um, then as diagnostics basically on the basically um, mostly at the exit of the plasma accelerator you have you can have multiple um, devices at least uh, um, you should um, record the charge by either um, ICTs or uh, charge calibrated screens and um, the electron energy um, should be recorded by an electron um, spectrometer which is basically um, in the most setup a magnetic dipole and then you can basically place also um, X-ray diagnostics um, to record the um, bitterton radiation from the acceleration process. You can um, also place to, um, uh, diagnostics for transition radiation um, and um, also um, quite beneficial is transverse probing of the beam. And um, this is like for my work at the HDR. So um, this is basically the, the footprint of the experimental building on the um, bottom left. Whereas basically here, um, yeah, basically this is the, um, the laser building, uh, the, the laser lab with the Traco high power laser source, which is a Titan Sapphire laser system with um, 800 nanometers and um, up to four joule energy on target and pulse length of about uh, 30 femtoseconds. And the um, very good thing here, or the, the unique parameter here is that basically the stress abstrailer base shoe is um, really good and um, also um, uh, offers a good uh, shot to shot stability. And here on the green, you see basically the um, electron laser acceleration lab which is shown here in the, um, the figure. And here on the left side is the experimental chamber with um, the laser wave field shut up. And um, the, um, the, the unique point here on this uh, setup is basically that you can place um, the diagnostics for beta thermal radiation, like shown bottom, on the bottom here. You can place up to uh, 12 meters away from the source, which gives you um, a good um, possibility to attenuate your um, X-ray radiation from the source in order to um, record them uh, for single pixel events, for instance. And the question is now, can we actually see um, 
um, plasma accelerators. This is possible if you um, have a transverse probing, which gives you the um, plasma density, and also um, if it's a few cycle probe, um, gives you the possibility to see um, how the plasma um, cavity is um, traveling to the plasma channel. So this is what you see here. This is um, like um, um, pump probe images um, from the plasma channel for two different wavelengths and uh, two different delays between um, the pumping and the probing. So basically the different um, times of the acceleration process. And um, if you want to uh, detect the beta radiation, um, the first step would be that you basically place a scintillator on axis, which is, um, could be um, some um, a screen with cesium iodide, for instance. And um, this is what um, have been done or, um, many times before. Here, this group um, have basically, uh, for these um, four consecutive shots, used two different injection schemes on the upper um, on the upper row. Basically, they used um, uh, self injection or wave breaking, and um, on the second row, they used ionization injection. And you see that basically there's a big difference between these injection schemes. Um, Self-injection is less um, um, well reducible in terms of the shape of this um, uh, profile from the veteran radiation. For the ionization injection, you see basically that um, this also, if you do like hundreds of shots, you always get the same um, shape of the profile. And um, you can also um, show that um, this uh, profile depends on the laser, depend, uh, laser polarization, as shown here on the um, bottom. When you basically turn the laser polarization, this profile is also turning. And um, the next step it can be then that you base between the source and your detector a uh, sharp um, small object which um, then introduces uh, Fresnel diffraction into your beam, as shown here on this um, setup here, so to say. So this um, is basically the raw image from the detector, and what you see is that the bright side is basically here illuminated by the direct X-ray beams, and um, here uh, this is basically the shadow of um, this um, uh, knife edge. And um, when we count this data along, um, per, like, um, along a line like this, you basically um, can um, fit a model based on these Fresnel assumptions that um, gives you um, a best fit for um, a source size. In this term, I mean, in this case, it is about um, one micron in source size. Another um, advanced method is um, that you basically, instead of uh, just imaging only the profile, you can um, try to record the spectra of the photons. So this can be done um, when you detect uh, single, uh, single um, photons only. So you have to reduce by some means the um, intensity on your uh, detector. It's shown here on the left side. So if you um, can basically detect single um, photons like here, you can bind them to an energy resolved spectrum here, and uh, from the spectrum and, and its shape, you can basically um, deduce the beta um radius, which gives you um, where you can deduce the source size of the electron beams inside the plasma. It is also possible to do um, the spectral recording with um, crystals, so this is, um, in this case, is a um, a high order, highly oriented um, pyrolytic graphite, which um, diffracts on one axis um, the X-rays uh, according to its energy, and the other axis is basically um, the spatial axis where you basically have the um, spatial resolution of your um, beam still. And um, for instance, this um, setup is particularly suited for um, for pump probe experiments where you can um, have one part of the beam um, probed with a target and the other uh, part of the beam is your reverence of the um, um, radiation, so to say. And um, if you have a setup as um, like this here, where you can basically record um, the plasma density, the electron energy, and um, also the um, the, the source size by mean of beta um, spectroscopy, for instance, then you can build a model with this 
understood um, assumptions and um, reconstruct the trace space of the bunch in the plasma. And with this, you can then basically um, deduce even the emittance of the bunch with the correlation beam, uh, with the correlation term. And um, okay, then I will just quickly uh, talk about the decoherence of the bunch. I mean, um, an electron in the transverse phase space will uh, perform an orbit um, looking like this here. So this is the injection point, and then will start to orbit and uh, gain energy and um, yeah, orbit with the Betterton frequency. And when you look at a bunch like this here, which has a certain energy spread on on the left side, during the acceleration process, each of these uh, slices with different energy will gain, um, will have a different um, rotation frequency. That means depending on the bunch size, on the energy spread, uh, sorry, on the bunch length and the energy spread, the, um, there will be a different um, possibility of these, the different um, speed, sorry, a different speed of these um, slices of one energy and um, so the advance in, in phase, or the, the spread and phase of these slices um, can be either um, like this case on the, um, this one here, where you basically um, these slices in the transverse phase space start to overlapping again and where you're minimizing the emittance or the, the, where you can have a minimized um, divergence, so to say, which is basically the projection on the, of the momentum. Or you can also have the, this case here, basically, where you fill out the um, phase space completely and um, will have, uh, in the end um, of the acceleration process, um, maximized uh, divergence. And um, you can also look at this in terms of uh, emittance. So uh, here, by the simulation, you basically can, um, you basically start at the injection and the, um, the transmitting, uh, the emittance is growing rapidly. And um, as shown here with this um, plot of the transverse phase space, then, you s then the acceleration process starts, and um, with this, the slices um, try to rearrange again, and which leads to, um, um, to a smaller emittance. And when this point is reached, so basically the energy um, spread is compensating the bunch length, then um, you um, your uh, emittance is increasing again and uh, approaching um, a saturation point at some um, distance. Okay, and with this, I will just um, show a comparison here. I mean, here you have a, the, um, the peak brightness of a source over the um, X-ray energy. So, and um, what you see here on the bottom is just um, just um, the X-ray tubes, okay. Then you have um, the better relation here by the black dashed line. You have um, Bremsstrahlung, you have undulated sources, and um, yeah, here you see the um, LTLS, okay. And if you just pick um, the better source as, a, um, not as a diagnostic method, but as a source, then um, you have the possibilities to um, to use this as a source for um, like phase contrast imaging or absorption contrast imaging, like on the left side here, or you can also use this for X-ray spectroscopy of the um, close to the edge, for instance, because um, you have a bright um, spectrum. And um, so now I would like to conclude my talk. Basically, I have shown that um, laser wake field accelerators have achieved impressive uh, beam parameters already. She has shown uh, free electron lasing, and um, she has shown that it basically required a new developed um, diagnostic um, in order to um, see that um, the acceleration process. And um, basically, uh, these plasma accelerators are now ready to use them as a new driver for light sources or um, for pump probe experiments. And um, with this, I would like to thank you for your um, attention and for your patience. Thank you, Alexander, for this very nice overview on the potentiality of the plasma acceleration also as a radiation source and not only to accelerate only the electrons. 
Questions? I don't see the question because there are the lights or uh, in front of me or because there are no questions. Anyway, I have a question. So you show the improved stability of the injection scheme. So when you showed the several pulses with pure helium that the beam is different shot by shot, while when you have shown the Yes, here. When you have shown uh, the mixture with uh, helium and nitrogen, uh, it's uh, really a stable beam like a uh, conventional accelerator, which is the, the reason of the improved stability in, in this case. Um, yeah, I would say so. I mean, the, um, I mean this is typical. Um, basically um, studied as uh, or assumed that um, during this acceleration process, I mean, um, sorry, I mean, what happens in ionization injection is that basically um, your electrons are ionized by the, um, not by the outer part of the beam, uh, of the laser pulse, sorry, but ionized closer to the um, peak of the intensity. That means there's a certain probability that these are also, um, can interact with the laser pulse. Mm -hmm. And um, with this is also possible that they have um, um, preferred um, plane of oscillations which can be in the plane of the laser polarization. And it means that basically, I mean, what you, oh, sorry, um, what you would basically see from this um, elongation here, I mean, that this is typically um, along the laser polarization axis. Yeah, so um, you would expect that the electrons um, mainly radiate when they are oscillating in this um, um, uh, when they are oscillating in this plane. Questions? Otherwise, I have another question. So you are dealing with laser of 10 to the 18 watt of a square centimeter, okay? So I'm working on the diagnostics. I would like to put my diagnostics as close as possible to the source of electrons. So to make a measurement of everything on all the properties, special transverse property immediately. But I have to remove the laser first. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Which is the minimum size that I need to remove the laser until the power is going down to a decent level? So in any case, there is a forbidden zone in which I cannot put my instrumentation in this kind of accelerator. Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, the thing is, um, I mean, the question is how you remove the laser pulse from um, the axis. I mean, one, one thing would be um, by placing a, an aluminum, a thin aluminum foil, for instance, and an angle, so you're basically reflecting um, the laser beam out of the axis. Um, this um, foil typically has a, a, a threshold, a damage threshold, and um, so um, this can be reached depending on how the laser is focused inside the plasma target. It can change, it can um, depend on how you are basically coupling with your laser beam into the um, plasma, but it typically will um, be easily destroyed if you come closer and closer. Uh, another idea would uh, be like um, using um, a tape drive, for instance, which can be used for also with um, uh, transition radiation. In, in case of transition radiation, you want to be really, really close to the uh, electron source to collect as much as possible of the um, uh, transition radiation. But then, um, of course, your tape is easily uh, sorry, not tape yet, your foil is easily um, burned. So um, what you can do is there basically using a tape which is renewed every, with every shot, so to say. Mm -hmm. But in any case, there is a, a distance, a minimum distance in which you cannot operate. So you cannot put this tape immediately after the interaction, or yes. Um, or you need uh, some drift because you have a waste and you need that uh, the, the dimension of your laser spot is increasing and so the power density will decrease or not. You can uh, put immediately. Uh, sorry? 
So you can put the tape immediately after the interaction. Um, I mean, since the, pl the tape will be basically um, destroyed with every shot. Yeah. So, um, but it is an overcritical density. That means that it will reflect the laser beam, even if it's the plasma, it will reflect it. And this is what you want. Um, so, um, from my experience, you can get it like um, millimeters close to it. Millimeter. Okay. Yeah. It also depends. I mean, it depends actually on the really setup, of course. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, we can uh, thanks Alexander again. Thank you. <laughs> so before moving uh, to the next speaker, uh, I have a general announcement. Uh, all the people that uh, have a talk uh, tomorrow, please uh, upload uh, immediately. Immediately means yesterday. They, uh, their talk. Uh, and also the people that have not yet uploaded the paper, do that, please, right now. So the next speaker is uh, Carlos Salgado. Uh, he will uh, uh, tell us something about angular resolved Thomson parabola spectrometer for laser-driven ion accelerator. He obtained his bachelor's degree in physics at the University of Salamanca in Spain in 2014 and completed his master's degree in laser physics at the same university the year after. Since then, he's a researcher and PhD student at the Spanish Center for Pulsed Laser in Spain, where he has focused his research interest on plasma and beam diagnostics for ultra-bright laser plasma accelerator experiment. Carlos? Thanks uh, a lot. Thanks for the kind introduction and first to the organizing committee for having me here and let me explain you our research in Salamanca, in CLPU. So I also come from a laser, high power laser facility as well. So I'm very glad that my talk has been allocated in this time. So the motivation of our field has been already nicely introduced. So I can move faster. So I'm going to present, I'm going to be very specific. I'm going to present one of the diagnostics we have developed to measure the beams that we generate with high power lasers in Salamanca. So I'm going to skip the most part of the introduction, but the main summary I want to stress is that the main, most common IOX acceleration scheme, which is TNSA, the so-called target normal seed acceleration, is the most common because it's the less demanding in terms of uh, laser parameters and target parameters. Uh, creates a very specific uh, beam with a very particular uh, properties, like uh, we heard them before. We have a multi-species beam in which we have a mix of protons, light ions, electrons, and so on, with a very Brothman spectra, quasi-Maxwellian shape, with a cutoff around the tens of MeV. Uh, in some cases, we have uh, reached, as, as you heard before, the cutoff of 100 MeV, and they are highly divergent. And all these properties as well are linked to each other because the energy uh, depends on the divergence. So the, the beam is not at all homogeneous. So it's very tricky. And also they are very short in time and the, they are supposed to have a very good transversal uh, quality, which is very interesting for possible applications in which we have to, we have to transport and select and focalize the beams, for instance. Well, so for, due to these characteristics, one of the mo uh, most uh, common used uh, diagnostics is the Thomson parabolas, which are not only spectrometers, but also they have the power to discriminate between the species of, the, of our beams, which is perfect for the kind of beams we have. Uh, the operation principle is pretty simple. An entrance pinhole selects just a tiny part of the beam, uh, a part of the beam with insignificant uh, angular spread normally, and this so-called beamlet travels through our detector, is deflected by Lorentz force by an electric and magnetic field which are parallel. So if we set a two-dimensional active detector, that can be a microchannel plate, MCP, or on the on the drawing, and we set it uh, perpendicular to the original direction of the, of the incoming beamlet, the particles will draw traces onto the detector. So each trace will correspond to a different uh, species, and the position along the trace will correspond, will be linked to the energy. Actually, you have there the analytical expression when uh, the fields are perfect and 
and non-relativistic uh, beams are in play. Well, so uh, if we want to access, I mean, we want to access, uh, well, there is one main drawback about this is that the lack of angular resolution. So if we want to access angular information, we thought, well, actually, it's not a new idea, but we thought on a, using a mask of pinholes, like an array of them, instead of a single one. So we can measure multiple traces as a, at the same time, in like a tomography-like measurement, and we can access simultaneously single shot and in high repetition rate. Well, I will do a disclaimer. In our community, in laser plasma, uh, high repetition means uh, whatever that is over a single shot, so even one earth is high repetition rate. So this is the case we have, and this is a microscope, uh, simple microscope uh, picture of the of the pinhole array that we use in the beginning, which are just simply three pinholes in a row. So we did the experiment. You have there the parameters of the experiment, which are not so important for for the moment because we we are not interested in that. And the setup looks like something like that. By constrain of the experiments that you don't see on the drawing, we had to place the Thomson parabola very far away, as far as a half a meter. In such a highly divergent beam, even by having several uh, pinholes, they are so close to each other, actually the drawing is at scale, they, they are so close to each other that uh, we are almost probing the same part of the beam. Well, we will go to that later. So the kind of picture that we have, the kind of signal, the raw data is something like that. It's a bit of a mess, but I can identify for you the species. So we have carbon-4, carbon-5, carbon-6, and, and proton ions. Um, the way we analyze this is very simple. We have a particle uh, tracker which simulates the trajectories of the particles inside the detector and calculates the Lorentz force. So we don't only know which uh, trace correspond to which species, but we all we know, uh, we also know what is the position of the particle in such trace for a certain energy, so we can have actually proton spectra and all, all kind of ion spectra. I show you here one of them for, for, for instance, the proton left uh, beamlet spectra. Spectrum, as you can see, uh, that is the typical TNSA uh, quasi Maxwellian spectra um, with a cutoff around the 15 MeV. Well, actually, we had to be a bit careful to, to take care about the crossing because in this configuration, the traces between different species cross each other, so we have to be a bit careful to remove those data. Well, and the good thing about our detector is that we can actually compare the spectra from different parts of the beams. So in the big drawing, we, we have proton from the left, center, and right beamlets. In the top left, in the in top right, sorry, we have the comparison of the four uh, of the three carbon four beamlets, and in the bottom right, we have the all the species for the left beamlets. As expected, the similar they look very similar to each other. So we, sorry, we wanted to do a step forward and increase the area that we probe so we ha see larger differences and also to improve the resolution. So we went for a second setup in which we brought the Thomson parabola much, much closer to the interaction point, as close as uh, 15 millimeters. So the first effect is that the, I mean, the separation between the pinholes start to be comparable with the total divergence of the beam which actually uh, it starts to be comparable to the acceptance of a possible transport system as a quadrupole, which is uh, start to be interesting for applications. And also, other effect we have is that the traces get quite thicker. And this is main because uh, the spatial and angular resolution has increased by uh, increasing the acceptance individual of every of the pinholes. So they are so close to the origin of the beam, so they are cl so close, I mean, they are so big in comparison with the, with the beam that many trajectories are allowed to go through the pinholes, and the result on the, on the detector is something like that. Um, we cannot any longer uh, differentiate between the carbon species and because, as you see, they, are, they overlap to each other, and they also they overlap with the proton uh, traces. So we could um, modify all the geometry of our detector in order to, to separate the traces enough, but uh, we wanted to do something with that. So we went for a final configuration in which uh, we managed to separate the traces. So 
Uh, first of all, the MCP broke down at this point of the experiment, so we had to ch uh, change the active detector. We use a, a plastic scintillator of 1.5 millimeters uh, of thickness. And the good thing, the one advantage of this is that we is, I mean, they can sell it, uh, they sell it in a four side, so you can cut it as, as big as you want. So the bigger sides allow us to use four pinholes instead of three. The bad side, first of all, one reason one is that the 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 response to the protons now depends with the energy because this scintillator I mean, depends uh, will depend the response with the Bragg peak of the protons. So uh, mm, properly calibration needs to be done with this uh, scintillator, and secondly, they are transparent. Um, well, for the first reason, uh, as long as we don't compare between different energies, it's okay. So the data we are going to show you here is just a comparison between different traces, but the same energy level, so we don't need the calibration for that. And also, uh, the transparency, uh, so, I mean, we need to shield the plastic uh, against optical light, and in a, because in a laser experiment we have a lot of optical photons and near infrared. So what we did is to co we covered this uh, plastic scintillator with a 12 micron thick pocket of film, which is a plastic insulator. With this, I mean, this uh, film was uh, was thought and was simulated in Monte Carlo. So the carbon ions of the range of interest were stopped, but meanwhile the protons can go through. We checked that with the full uh, setup of the of the Thomson parabola. We only saw one, one can of traces. So if we don't have carbon ions, we can switch off the electric field and we will have just straight traces that are purely deviated by the magnetic field. And these are the kind, the two kind of, uh, the kind of traces that we have. So the picture in the right is exactly the, para the um, configuration I just told you and the picture in the left is slightly different. We increase even further the magnification of the, of the system by separating the plastic scintillator further away so the flight distance is larger for the, for the ions and actually the, the particles can, can diverge larger. Well, in both cases, we select four representative energies, which are the cutoff MeV around 15 MeV and 12 MeV for both shots, 10 MeV, 5, 5 MeV, and other energy, which is actually the more or less the median of the of the spectra. And if we thought, if we think about these pictures, what actually what, if we measure the thickness of these traces, what we are actually measuring is an energy resolve measurement of the uh, e of the divergence of that beamlet exactly at the, I mean, of, that's it, of that beam exactly at the position where the pinhole intercepts the, the beam. So basically this is a measurement of the trace space of the beam. It's a discretized measurement, so we only are measuring four points, which are the four points of the four pinholes, but if we plot it uh, in the y-axis, the, the line nodes of each of these uh, tray thickness, what we have is a tray space uh, measurement. So this is what we have here. Uh, actually, the plots and the numbers that you have there are the RMS divergence of each of the beamlet, taking into account th the, the pinhole aperture projection. So we, we have a, made a, a deconvolution already because of the finite size of the, of the pinholes. But most importantly, what we have here is an energy resolve measurement. So this is the trace space for the mean energy. This is for 5 MeV, for 10, and for the cutoff energy. If we join the centroids of each of these uh, lineouts, what we see is that our beam inside the area that we're probing is quite, uh, quite it has a quite a linear correlation. And finally, but, um, probably the most interesting part is that by analogy with the pepper pot method, or also called the, I mean, the one dimensional pepper pot method, which is the slit method, we could give an estimation of the horizontal RMS geometrical emittance of the beam, of course, inside the area that we are looking at the beam. So the numbers for both shots 
for the left and for the right are over there. In I remember this this is just the lateral RMS uh, geometrical emittance. But the good thing, and is the the plot in the top, is that we know we can know how each part of the spectra contributes to the total emittance of the beam. And this is pretty interesting because in most of the applications in which we will have to focalize our beam, only a part of the spectrum will be selected because these super broadband beams that we have in laser plasma uh, interaction are are normally not well fitted for this kind of application. They have to be transported focalizers. Also, we see the trend is pretty clear. Uh, for less energy, the um, emittance increases, which actually makes sense with the kind of, uh, of plasma process that occurs on the, on the generation of these ion beams. Um, if we can calculate all the emittance for all the energy, as, ju as just so far, but we can, we can do it with all of them, we could know what is the total emittance of the beam. Um, if we want to compare these uh, emittance numbers with uh, previous results, we have to give it in normalized emittance, which is the geometricals times beta gamma. And we see when we compare with previous TNSA beams, we are within the range of previous measurements. And well, I, I only showed two shots, but we have done, I think, more than 200, because as I told you, we have a higher repetition rate system and a high repetition rate diagnostic so we did a full scan not not only a statistical study but also we moved the detector uh, left and right up and down so we could have a full characterization of the of the beam of all, all the angles and we have seen uh, data as, as strange as this one you see on the on the picture with very big difference between energies and traces and angles so it's probably uh, the data is under analysis. Uh, will be probably quite interesting to see what what is the outcome. And well, I think my time is over. That's all for the moment. I, I will just sum up. So we have developed a versatile instrument, which uh, was tested uh, for uh, laser plasma accelerated ions. Uh, in one working mode, we can work as a, just an angular resolve tomography like Thomson parabola in other working mode which is basically the same but at other distance it can work as an emittance and trace space monitor of ion beams. It's instantaneous, single shot and uh, compatible with high repetition rate of our lasers and uh, with some engineering we could have we could implement also the electric field and uh, be able to compare at the same time different species. So I think that's all thank you for your attention. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, very impressive, this measurement uh, of the emittance uh, versus the energy of different parts of the beam. Questions? Thank you for this excellent talk and for this interesting, for the presentation of this super interesting subject. Uh, my question is, you, you present uh, the, the yield of charged particles. What's about the yield of non-charged particles? Do so you have any idea about X-rays, respectively neutrons? Uh, well, so normally in laser plasma acceleration, the, the acceleration of neutrons is not immediate. So normally we have to work with a deuteret target or with some kind of converter. So. As far as we know, we don't generate neutrons in this kind of experiments. We didn't measure. But nevertheless, the, the diagnostic we are using is not sensitive to neutrons. What I can tell you, I forgot to mention, and you, it's good that you told me. So those points you see at the bottom of the picture actually are the X-rays um, that are not, I mean, in our experiments, the generation of these ions and all this radiation comes with the generation of X-rays and extreme ultraviolet and soft X-rays and all the, all the spectra. And uh, the photons are not deflected by the field, so these three points actually represent like the, the basically the projection of the, of the X-ray generated on the target onto the detector. So we could have at least some idea, if we analyze that, some idea of the shape and size of the X-ray spot that is generated on the target. But um, I, I cannot say anything about the neutrons. 
Thank you. Welcome. Other questions? Please, the people with the microphone, uh, if uh, they see somebody that want uh, to ask, uh, go there, because uh, I don't see. I mean, well, I have uh, a question. Uh, can you come back uh, to the slide uh, where there are the measurement uh, of the emittance uh, sure. versus the energy? Sure. Here. Yes, over there. So you know that this formula of the emittance, that is the formula that everybody quotes, uh, huh? is valid only for monochromatic beam. But if the beam is not monochromatic, uh, there is uh, an additional term that is popular, this additional term in plasma acceleration that is coming from the energy spread, the beam sides, the beam divergence. So with your data, have you never tried, for my knowledge, you are the only one that have data that measure emittance a different energy in the beam. Hmm. Maybe you can try to, to fit your data with this formula that have never had experimental validation. Okay, I, I didn't know about that, but what I can tell you, I'm, as we separate the energies after the pinholes, I'm not sure which formula should be applied. Because, because uh, you just uh, you sample, uh, ju just, uh, you make a sample of the, your uh, beam at different energy. Yes. Okay, so you measure a deposition when you separate in reality. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so there, uh, you, in the phase space, uh, uh, you have uh, different ellipses uh, that uh, have different uh, momentum due to the fact that they have different energy. So that's the reason because uh, this formula cannot apply anymore, but there is an additional term that is in conventional accelerator. It's totally negligible uh, because the energy spread is in the level uh, very small with respect uh, to the level of plasma accelerator. But in the plasma accelerator, uh, it's quite, uh, could be a, a huge term. Yes. But there are a couple of, of papers, one from Flotman, one from Migliorati, that uh, describe this phenomenon, but there is no measurement so far about that. So maybe you can try to fit your data to that. Okay. I'm, I'm, yes, sure. Was, uh, just I'm sure it's pretty interesting. I think we can, we can do it at all. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Otherwise, uh, we can thank you, Carlos Seguin. So we can move to the next speaker. So the next speaker is Aurel Goldblatt, LINAC4 Laser Profile and Emittance Meter Commissioning. She was born in Switzerland and did her scholarship in Geneva. She has a bachelor degree in applied physics from the engineering school of Geneva. Before working at CERN, she worked a couple of years as a lab engineer in the medic in Bentec domain and therefore an electrovalves company. She has worked at CERN since 2009 as a technical engineer for the Beam Instrumentation Group Profile Measurement Section. Here tasks are various from hardware design and implementation to measurement analysis. Please. Thank you very much for this introduction. So uh, I will present uh, today the LINAC4 Laser Emittance Peter Commissioning at CERN. So let's start with uh, some cons context and uh, the concept of the instrument. So as you may know now, the LINAC4 is the source for the proton beams for the whole chain of accelerators at CERN. So it accelerates uh, H minus ions up to 160 MeV. And then these ions are converted into protons at the injection of the PS booster synchrotron. So the laser emittance meter is based on electron stripping by photon interaction. So this has two advantages. First one, uh, the measurement is really transparent for the beam. And the second one, it's an instrument that cannot be destroyed by a high intensity beam as could be uh, the wire scanner, for example. So what do we do? We use a laser that we focused into the H minus beam. And at the interaction point, uh, the electrons are stripped. So these electrons are collected and deviated into an electromultiplier via a little dipole. It's visible uh, here. It's the, the, red, the, the blue circle here. And this allows us to reconstruct 
the profile of the instrument of the of the beam, sorry, by scanning the laser across uh, the beam. The H0 particles that are left, they go straight and they are collected onto a diamond strip detector. I'm sorry, I'm not good with this uh, mouse. <laughs> so it's the red uh, circle. And uh, this allows us to reconstruct the emittance and the profile of the beam. So we have two systems installed in the Linux 4. So here there is a 3D model of the Linux 4 machine. So the source is on the, on the right. Yes, on the right. And the beam is coming from the right to the left on the picture. So you have a first laser injector. Let's see if I'm better now. No. So you have a first laser injector here, yes. And uh, the diamond detector that is associated is here in front of the main dump. So in this area, uh, the dispersion should be low. Then we have a second detector which is located here into two dipole magnets and the diamond is over there and at this place the dispersion should be, uh, we should have a, uh, sorry, a, a low H0 background level. So our laser uh, is a short pulsed fiber laser of a wavelength of 1064 nanometers, so it's in the red. It's tunable in power, in frequency, and in pulse width. And we transport this laser from the hutch, which is in the surface of the, of the machine, to the tunnel via large mode area uh, fibers. So here you have a picture of some of the optics we have to uh, focus the laser into the fiber. So we have uh, two main diagnostics, as, as I said. So we have the diamond detectors. They are made of polycrystalline chemical vapor deposition. So this is a material that is radiation tolerant. So our sensors are made of 28 channels with a pitch of 0 0.34 millimeter. And we use two different shapes, 20 by 20, or 32 by 10 millimeters, and all the sensors are on movable stages. So in total, we have four sensors. We have two per instrument, and one for each plane, horizontal or vertical. So as I said, this allows us to reconstruct the emittance of the beam and the profile. We have as well electromultipliers. So we use the model of Hamamatsu that has an aperture of 20 millimeter, and again of 10 to the six. And with that, we can uh, do some profile measurement. In addition, we have as well photodiodes just to monitor the output of the fibers and see if the transmission of the laser is still good. And we have as well energy meters and cameras that we use uh, during the technical stop to check the transmission, optimize it, and as well the, the focusing of the, of the laser uh, into the beam. So let's talk a bit about uh, acquisition and control now. So the LINAC4 sends a macro pulse of 600 microseconds long every 1.2 seconds. And this macro pulse is divided into four bunch trains of 150 microseconds. And each of these bunch trains is uh, dedicated to be injected in uh, one of the four uh, PS booster rings. So each train is chopped at one megahertz, which is uh, the frequency of the PS booster. And this period is reconstructed with the Linux 4 RF. So our laser is also synchronized with the PS booster uh, frequency of one megahertz. And as I said, the frequency is tunable, but we generally use 500 kilohertz and a pulse width of 100 nanosecond. That means that we are able to strip electrons of one over two um, a bunch of the macropuls of the LINAC4. The acquisition of the laser is synchronized with the start and stop ring triggers of the, of the beam. So all this control is uh, made via a national instrument, PXI, running LabVIEW. So we have the traditional cards necessary for that. And we use as well pre-amplification cards for the diamond signals. And I just uh, wanted to show the, di the frequencies, the, the sampling frequencies we use. So for the diamond, it's 50 megahertz. 
and for the electron multiplier in the photodiode, it's 120 megahertz. So all these control settings and uh, acquisition is integrated into the CERN control infrastructure called FESA. So now let's move on and uh, let's talk about the data processing. <clears throat> so the diamond data are processed in real time in the FPGA. So on the left you can see uh, the uh, raw data of one diamond channel. So in the blue area, what you can see, it's the H0 particle background uh, from beam gas interaction. And you can really see uh, the one microsecond bunch period bunches uh, uh, here. And on top of these bunches, one over two bunches, you have a laser pulse. So this is the area that is interesting for us. So the right plot is a zoom of this area. And what we do for processing, we take a window around this pulse, we subtract the background, and we integrate the area under the pulse, which is in blue here. So what we get at the end, we get for one channel and one laser pulse, one integrated data. So by doing a scan of the laser through, through the beam, we are able to reconstruct the phase space ellipse. So this is an example of the phase space ellipse for one pulse. So just for you to know, a full laser scan takes about 10 minutes because we move the laser by steps and this happens every 1.2 seconds. So it's synchronized with the LINAC4 uh, macropulse. So from the phase space ellipse, we can calculate the emittance because it's the area of the phase space ellipse. And we do that applying a threshold. Uh, it, it means that we will subtract a background, uh, uh, an intensity threshold, and what is under this threshold, we consider it as background. So on the top right, you can see the emittance uh, of one pulse um, versus this threshold. And what we do now, we, to, we take a, tr a threshold that is located uh, in the inflection point of this curve around uh, here. So for this example, it's about 2%. So basically, all the intensity that is below 2%, we consider it as background, and we don't take it into account in, uh, for the calculus of the emittance. From the phase space ellipse, you can as well calculate the profile of the beam just by projecting this ellipse along the x axis. So it's what you can see on the down uh, right uh, plot over there. The processing of the electron multiplier data is really the same, but it's done offline. So again, we select a window around the pulse we subtract the background and we integrate uh, the area under the pulse. And from that, by scanning the laser, we can get directly the profile of the beam. So we were able to compare uh, the profile from the electron multiplier and from the diamond. And so you can see uh, the green and black uh, curves over there that are the profiles along the LINAC4 macropulse. So each dot is the profile of one pulse. And you can see that these two uh, are uh, the electron multiplier and diamond profiles in the horizontal plane, and they are in really good agreement. It's less than a percent. However, in the vertical plane, you can see that the, the red curve, which is the profile of the electron multiplier, is systematically smaller than the diamond curve in blue. And we think that uh, we are limited by the electron multiplier acceptance because at this location, the vertical beam size is bigger than the horizontal one. It could also come from the setting of the uh, little uh, magnet that we use to bend the electrons into the electron multiplier because we use one setting for the whole laser scan and it's optimized in order to have the highest intensity when the laser is really uh, hitting the particle that's at the center of the beam. Also, what we could have is a little tilt of the bending magnet that could lead to some coupling between the horizontal and vertical plane and a vertical kick. 
So all these uh, will be checked and verified by doing a scan of uh, the electro um, multiplier magnet. But for this, we need some dedicated pain time. So now I would like to share with you uh, some issues we have <laughs> with the diamond detector. So um, we have a perturbation that is common to all diamond channels and it's a strong harmonic at 50 kilohertz on the integrated data which correspond to a 2 megahertz perturbation on the raw data. So on the top right you can see a Fourier transform of the diamond channel uh, signals when the detector is out of the beam, so it's not collecting H0 particles. And you can see that there is this strong harmonic at 50 kilohertz. So this is an electrical noise, and we were able to spot that it takes source in the cables between uh, the diamond detector and the amplificators. So we plan to improve the shielding there during the next winter stop. And for now, uh, we apply a digital notch filter to get rid of this uh, frequency. But um, Fourier transform of the diamond uh, channel signals when the diamond is inside uh, the beam, so it's collecting H0, shows that the beam itself seems to transport as well some perturbation. And for that, for now, we have uh, no solution. We didn't think about any solution. So I would like to show you some emittance measurement we did in June. So on the top, we did a uh, vertical measurement the 21st of June. And you can see on the left an example of the phase space relief measured on the one of one pulse of the macropulse. And on the right, you have a plot of the emittance along the macropulse. You can clearly see the four periods of the macropulse. And what you can see as well is that the vertical, the, the vertical emittance seems to vary along the pulse, and especially it's decreasing during the first period. So we did a second measurement one week later. We were able to measure the vertical and the horizontal uh, phase space. And what we could see is about the same. So the vertical emittance is decreasing uh, during the first period of the, of the macro pulse. Here we had only three, uh, three periods, not the four. And it's not, uh, it doesn't seem to appear uh, on the horizontal uh, emittance. So we don't know if this is really physical or if it's coming from artifact from maybe the notch filter that adds edge effect of or maybe some processing uh, of the data. So we need to do more analysis uh, uh, from that. So to conclude, we were really happy to be able to do the first systematic measurement uh, with this instrument uh, this year. So what I mean by systematic is to measure the emittance along the whole macropulse of the LINAC-4. We noticed that we have a strong perturbation coming from electrical source, but as well, it seems to be transported by the LINAC-4 beam. So we use for now a digital notch filter to filter uh, the, the, the main important uh, perturbation, and we plan to improve the shielding during the next winter stop. The electro multiplier and diamond profile comparison showed a really good agreement in the horizontal plane. But in vertical plane, it seems that maybe the electromultiplier acceptance is a bit small, or it might come from uh, the setting of the magnet. So uh, we need to do some more uh, measurements to, to confirm all that. And concerning the emittance measurement, uh, clearly the measurement we made showed us that we need to do more measurements and to do more analysis to understand why we have this variation of the vertical emittance along the macropulse. And what we would like to do too is to cross calibrate the instrument with some wire scanners. And for that, preferably, we will use the instrument uh, that is located in front of the dump line and not the one that is located in the transfer line that we used for now. 
So, oh, I'm still good, good. So uh, I'm finished <laughs> with my presentation. I, I would like to thank uh, all the people that worked uh, on this instrument already on, in the, during the past, uh, especially Thomas Hoffman, who uh, was a PhD student, and it was his project for his thesis at CERN, and the people from Royal Holloway who strongly uh, collab uh, collaborated, and uh, as well... Uh, uh, the people uh, now at CERN that helped us to uh, move uh, to the step here, that we are here now uh, and doing this uh, systematic commissioning. So it's a really nice uh, moment and uh, really interesting. So thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Thank you for showing us very interesting uh, emittance measurement. Questions, please. Yes, there is over there. Um, I, I thank you very much for this, for this interesting talk and, 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 and your, your interesting developments. Um, I have basically two questions. Um, first, you are using this cutoff um, for, the, for the percentages. It was on page 7, where, where, where you say they, they, they have the, the emittance as a function of this cutoff frequency, uh, cutoff uh, percentage, the threshold. This one, yes. Yes. Um, how do you do it? I mean, is there, what is the mathematical fitting procedure you are doing? <coughs> the so, first question, yeah. So for for now, uh, to the, the threshold we apply. Is, so here it's really the curve of the emittance, so it's the RMS emittance versus this threshold. So basically, uh, you, you, remove, uh, you remove data that are uh, under uh, this intensity threshold, and you calculate the emittance, and you can plot this curve. But for now, uh, the emittance, where, what threshold to use, it's really a guess. It's a guess. So we decided <laughs> to use a threshold that is really in uh, this, uh, the elbow of this curve, but definitely this is something we need to dig more because uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a guess for now. Yeah. Would be interesting to, to discuss a bit the mathematical methods to do it on, on a reproducible manner uh, <clears throat> where I don't have any experience, but... Uh, uh, it's not just a guess. Uh, you, yeah. you, you if I can comment, Peter, uh, sorry, it's Federico. Yeah, uh, yeah in fact, uh, what Aurelie said, it's, uh, it's exactly right. We still have to go into the details about the, 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 perf the best threshold to, to choose. I think there are some theories saying that you should go where there is the maximum, the minimum of the, of the gradient of this variation. Uh, but uh, first of all, what we will try is to compare uh, uh, wire scanners and uh, wire grades that we have uh, available in the LINAC uh, to this method up using the same thresholding and then compare the two of them how they vary according to the threshold because you can do the, exactly the same also with the other instruments. But then uh, yeah, we will be very pleased to uh, improve. Uh, maybe there is already somebody in the room uh, <laughs> telling us a more academic way to choose the threshold. Well, not me. Uh, <laughs> it would be interesting for the solution. <laughs> um, and, and the second question is a bit uh, related to the diamond detector. Um, you, saw, you, you showed the variation um, from the beginning onwards. Sometimes the, um, these diamond detectors have some problems, which is called polarization. or uh, um, So the, the, the count rate goes a little mm -hmm. bit down, or the, or the pulse height indeed, per particle. Did you check this? Can you exclude this? That it's a, just an effect of the of the detector of the diamond detector itself, that the emittance varies at the beginning. No, we for now no, because uh, really these measurements were made quite uh, in, in summer, and I didn't have the time really to 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 really dig into into that. But as I said, w there there are more analyses to do definitely. And especially because I mentioned that maybe it could be uh, coming from the notch filter, that for sure had an edge effect, but it should as well apply on the horizontal plane, and we don't see that. So definitely there is, we need to, to, to verify a lot of things uh, to understand why uh, this is happening. 
And uh, that's a good point. I didn't know about that, and I uh, definitely take this into consideration, too. Yeah, okay, I can thank also you very add, much. Uh, a comment on this, uh, which is so on top of uh, what already correctly said. Uh, when we tested the signal at lower energies, because we tested also at 3 and 12 NEV uh, now a long time ago, uh, we, I think we proved we had uh, problems of implantation of the charged particles into the diamond sensor, which was affecting then the effect of the bias. Uh, but this is not the case in under 16 NEV. So we really believe it is more something else, the problem here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, maybe there is another question. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, very nice talk. It's, uh, it's great to see the progress over the years of uh, these laser systems and H minus beams. Um, but this is a very general question looking forward. Um, in any high intensity facility, uh, like we see uh, some of these uh, H minus beams applied to, the halo is incredibly important, and it's extremely difficult to characterize, particularly, uh, particularly when you're running at full power operations. So I wondered if you could extrapolate a little bit from the current experience and comment uh, on the possibility of getting out into the tails of the beam with a trustworthy halo measurement. This, I, as you say, I don't know really. So maybe Federico, you have uh, an answer to that. I'm sorry, he's my, my um, helper. <laughs> no, okay, you have to start from, uh, in this system, we know that we, with this uh, one micron diameter uh, laser, we strip 7% uh, of, uh, of the particles that are traversed by the, by the, beam, by the laser beam. Net. So I think the, the really high dynamic range for the taser is not uh, necessarily easy to achieve. Um, yeah, I cannot, I don't, then, yeah, we didn't study that, voila, uh, for the moment. <laughs> Thank you both. Any other question? Okay, if not, thank you, Aurelio, very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we move on to the next speaker, that is uh, Daniel Levin, uh, High Performance Scintillator Ion Beam Monitoring System. Daniel is a research scientist at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He received his PhD from Boston University in 1990 on the macro experiment at the Grand Sasso Underground Laboratory. Maybe the people know that doesn't work in the high energy physics uh, know uh, in any case Atlas experiment, but uh, macro experiment was a very big important experiment in the 90s uh, related to neutrinos oscillation, uh, dark matter, uh, uh, weak interactive particles. And uh, since 1998, he has collaborated on the Atlas experiment at CERN with a focus on the moon spectrometer and in dark matter searches. Currently, with a colleague from Integrated Sensor and Loma Linda University Medical Center, his group develops instrumentation from beam monitors and flash radiotherapy application. He also resides in Israel, Italy, Gran Sasso Lab, and at CERN. Do you speak Italian also? Un po'. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, well, good evening. Uh, I'm going to report on this uh, scintillator ion beam monitor, or SBM. So this is work which has been in development uh, with my lab, uh, integrated sensors, and um, uh, the facility for rare isotope beams at, uh, in East Lansing with Tom Ginter. Uh, so here's a photograph of our instrument. It's a, what we call a six-way cross for somewhat obvious reasons, or will be obvious. The major motivation is to provide uh, beam analysis and to be able to display results quickly in real time. And that's important because uh, operational rates in terms of costs at laboratories like FRIB can be upwards of $20,000 an hour, so it's very useful to have kind of an instantaneous real-time response to what the beam is doing by the uh, control. 
So the main features of this, uh, of this device uh, uses what we call novel use thin scintillators, which have some high sensitivity and very clean imaging. And importantly, these scintillators can be inserted and removed from the vacuum or from the beam without breaking vacuum. And uh, because of high resolution, we can provide beam centroids, widths, and amplitudes. They're thin, they're low mass, and at least for higher energy beams, they are uh, somewhat transmissive. Uh, and lastly, uh, we can see that there's a fairly wide dynamic range that can be provided. So those are the features and the ob objectives of this project. So here's a uh, our SOLIDWORKS drawing that shows the what we call a freeway cross has three transects. So uh, um, this is the laser pointer. One of these is for the um, there's a robotically controlled arm that controls a cassette of, in this case, six scintillators that can be uh, brought in and out of the beam. Uh, there's an optical axis for a imaging uh, device. This is a high resolution. Uh, CMOS sensor camera that's low noise. In this case, it's not super low noise, but it's 180C count is the noise floor. Uh, and then in the bottom, there's a placeholders for optical alignment, uh, crosshairs for alignment with the beam axis, and a placeholder also for another type of photo detector. So here's an image, uh, again, a drawing of this detector on its mount with the three axes. And in, here's the installation at FRIB. The important thing I want to point out here is um, that the front to back uh, footprint of this is only about 15 centimeters, so it's quite compact. So there are two types of scintillators. Um, they're thin, they're non-hygroscopic, and fairly radiation resistant. Uh, I'm under NDA not to disclose exactly what they are, but there are two types of material. So one's a polymer material. Uh, semi-crystalline organic polymer. Uh, it was initially designed and invented for industrial use for packaging and was since discovered to be quite a good uh, uh, scintillation uh, medium. It's semi-crystalline, has a hazy appearance and importantly has no internal reflections so light prefer preferentially escapes out the surfaces. And it's uh, also important, it's available in a large variety of uh, thicknesses, and we've worked with 200 microns down to one micron. So these, especially these thinner films are very attractive for transmissive applications. The second type of scintillator is called, we call HM. It's an inorganic polycrystalline uh, ceramic hybrid. It has an active layer that's embedded in a polymer matrix. It has also high light emittance and uh, no internal reflections. And I will describe those uh, and some lab tests we did. Uh, the display system in the DAQ for this uh, unit has a number of components to it. Uh, there's an image processing part which does all kinds of standard operations, background subtraction, uh, faulty pixel removal, and then all the necessary uh, affine transformations and rotations in order to present the uh, image beam in the beam, co uh, beam coordinate system. So this is a screenshot from a, our run at the FRIB. Uh, and I can just point out, here's the image of the beam, one example of the beam on the crosshair is centered in the beam pipe. And uh, this is also a false color display so you can see more details of the beam structure. So I'm gonna go over some test results. Uh, we have uh, we tested in many locations, uh, including um, the lab at U of M. Uh, and results from FRIB from last September. We've also run at the Michigan Ion Beam Laboratory with protons at Notre Dame uh, Radiation Laboratory and, uh, and elsewhere. And I maybe neglected to mention before that but one of the other motivations for us developing this device is for applications in flash high-dose radiation therapy, which is, uh, seems at least almost everybody I talked to here is now understands that this is a very hot topic. So here's uh, some test bench results using a, uh, a collimated beam from a strontium-90 beta source. So in this case, uh, I'm comparing two scintillators. 
Uh, one is uh, this CSI, uh, cri single crystal, uh, unpolished, uh, compared to our HM scintillator with the beam illuminating the scintillator from behind. And then the top is um, at zero degrees and the bottom is at 50 degrees. And this, me this measurement is done in the same optical framework as the six-way cross that I showed before. So there are uh, two primary results here. One is that the, uh, compared to the CSI, the image here is on the AHM is clean, is free of reflections, blooming, uh, distortions, and, and sidewall emissions that we would see on the crystal. And the secondly is that the overall signal strength because of the front surface emission is quite strong. In fact, in this case, it's about an order of magnitude larger than it is from the CSI. And uh, maybe a third point is, is that going from zero to 50 degrees does not change the peak amplitude. So it's fairly flat across angle. Uh, we did the same test with PM and compared it in this case to BC400, another standard. And uh, so here again, the image for the PM is clean and very well filled out compared to the BC400. This is for 200 micron thick scintillator. And uh, secondly is the ADC spectrum for the a a PM is uh, you know, quite elevated compared to the, um, to the BC400. It's about a factor of five average ADC is um, higher than the um, BC400. So now we're gonna move to the uh, FRIB. Uh, so this is data we took uh, last September, and we worked in the uh, RIA-3, the re-accelerated 3 MeV beamline with uh, Krypton-86 at around 3 MeV per uh, nucleon. And the currents we ran with ran from, uh, in this case, from uh, half a megahertz or half a, uh, 500,000 particles per second down to effectively single particles, which is not anything that previously the uh, detectors were able to actually uh, image. So I will cover some results here. Uh, so first, here's a image of the beam at, at FRIB. This is now in the camera view for a six millimeter thick uh, PM scintillator. Uh, and we, we ran also 275, 50, all those produced virtually identical signals at six microns, the uh, ions do penetrate. In fact, the, um, this uh, plot here at the bottom, there's my arrow. So this is uh, the current measured of a Faraday cup behind the scintillator when it's not in the beam, and then when it's in the beam, the current, and then when it's back out again. So when it's in the beam, a six micron thick passes still 75% of the of the uh, ions uh, pass through it. Of course, the energy is degraded, but they do pass through. And then the ADC spectrum here is uh, quite robust, so about 100 counts at, this, at the center, uh, very high above the noise floor. Uh, we've reduced the current now to five kilohertz, uh, and this is five kilohertz over uh, several square, about, well, about half a square centimeter or so. So the left is the zoomed out full field of view, and then we zoom in on the right to see again the beam, the beam structure with only five kilohertz. And here the signal is pretty robust, and uh, we infer from this that we can reduce the beam intensity down to uh, kilohertz and quite comfortably be able to detect it and, and, and make measurements of the profile. Uh, and now next we're going to change scintillators and go to the HM type and reduce the beam to effectively single particles. It's five to 10 hertz, uh, and these are one second exposures. So uh, we have uh, many hundreds of images like this, but what you see are uh, six individual uh, krypton hits on the scintillator, well separated in this case. And the Lego plot on the right just emphasizes the, the, uh, the nature of the hit uh, signal above the background. And then the centroid of these, uh, has a centroid error that's about two microns, but the width effectively reflects the um, point spread function of the optic optics of our system. Uh, so I should go back. So um, the, you know, we can integrate around each of these points, so single particle hits, and uh, extract a normalization factor 
of a single particle. So we've did, we did this for many, many hundreds of frames with many hits per frame to get an average normalization factor. And then we can then back calculate what the beam current was in this scintillator uh, going up to 500 kilohertz. So we, we did that. And so the y-axis on this plot represents the current measured by this technique. And it's plotted against the current reported to us by the control uh, operations of FRIB using four different technologies to establish uh, the beam rate. So what we can see is that we're able to establish the beam rate over uh, basically five orders of magnitude and that within the errors it's fairly linear. Uh, so now I, I began this talk by saying we want to be able to report results in real time. So that's what I'm going to show next. And so here's an, um, a run we did with uh, a rate of only 50 particles per second, so a very low rate, using the HM scintillator. And the test was to have uh, FRIB control move the beam incrementally in a kind of in a grid or a square pattern uh, around the beam pipe uh, to the best of their abilities to do so. And uh, here's the result of that test. So you can see uh, we have so six plots here. The upper left plot is the full field of view without any uh, massaging other than background subtraction. So there are actually hits in there, though it's hard to identify on the full field of view. Uh, we have an algorithm that does uh, very fast beam finding for weak beams. And then you can see the, the beam appear on that central upper plot. Uh, and then the upper right is showing the measured beam a metric for the uh, beam radius as a function of time. So this is updating at around one hertz. And then the X position and Y position history as it's happening in real time is then, then given and reported in terms of this, uh, the centroids of the um, upper, upper middle plot. And so you can see it advancing and changing. And then the, on the far right is the, uh, the X, Y, uh, two coordinate position of the beam as it's been moved around. And now, it, well, it rewinds and does the same thing. But you can see what it's, uh, what it's doing. So this kind of demonstration appeared to be really quite valuable and useful to the uh, beam operation. So I can wrap this up by reiterating that uh, this unit can provide um, precise beam profiling on a time scale of uh, a hertz or under. We're developing this to work faster right now. Uh, so the data from FRIB established that we can be linear over four, five orders of magnitude. We did extend the range of this somewhat. We tested at the Michigan Ion Beam Laboratory with one to six MeV protons. So there's up to 10 nanoamps. The image on the right is from that, uh, one of the tests at MIBL. And this is the uh, beam profile. This is a scanning beam profile obtained on one micron thick scintillator. Uh, so, um, I guess the last point I want to make is that the HM scintillator in particular uh, allows us really uh, high order magnitude single output compared to the much thicker CSI standard and allows uh, for very high sensitivity, especially for very low beam rates at, at uh, machines like, like FRIB. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, let me see. Is there any question? Yes. Well, Perhaps while they're, they're working on the microphone there, may I ask uh, about the uh, radiation tolerance of this material, how much can it take, and also uh, mechanically, how strong is it? Uh, uh, so you've got one micron thickness, how big an, er how big a, an area can you stretch this over, and how and mechanically is it, is it likely to pop at any time, or is it really strong enough? Uh, excellent questions. Uh, so I can say that because I almost have an answer. Uh, 
so in terms of radiation tolerance, referring to the, to the PM material, to the polymer, uh, the answer to that is, uh, depends. Uh, we tested this in two different ways. So in one test we conducted at uh, Notre Dame Radiation Laboratory, and there we exposed it to flash level radiation tests. And, uh, but it was, the material was in air, and or for a limited dose of about uh, a total dose of about 20 kilogray, uh, or for delivery rate of uh, a few gray per second, there was no measurable degradation. On the other hand, uh, at MIBL, in the proton beam, uh, at a rate of around 300 gray per second, uh, then, and this is done in vacuum, then you do measure degradation. Uh, the rate is approximately uh, half a percent change in light yield per kilogray in vacuum. Uh, but it does tend to recover. So if you leave it in the vacuum, it stays degraded. If you put it in air, after a few hours, it recovers. And at four hours, it recovers about 50%. So there is some recovery mechanism when it's exposed to presumably oxygen. As far as toughness is concerned, one mic the one micron material is difficult to work with, uh, but at already at six, it's not, and we can cover fairly large areas. At 200 microns, is absolutely, or even at 50 microns, there's no, no limit, and we are intending this to uh, be used for um, you know, radiation therapy applications where the you know, target size is about 30 by 30 centimeters. Uh, Alan kind of asked my question, but one other observation I'll make is we, our scintillator material we have we uh, put into APS around the, uh, the storage ring, a vacuum chamber, we'll see crazing, uh, crazing of, the, uh, of the scintillator material. So it, it looks like it develops micro cracks uh, near, the, uh, near the beam uh, chamber where the dose would be highest. If you ask if we saw crazing, Yes. No, no, I mean, I've seen it in solid scintillator, but these, these, are, these films, not with anything we've exposed it to. Uh, we've, at some rate, I can, we've managed to brown it, uh, and to discolor it, and that discoloration disappeared after, you know, after days and, and weeks. Uh, but I've not seen the cracking and crazing phenomenon. But I have seen it in, in, in more solid scintillators that have been in. Okay, thank you. Um, any other question? Yes. Yeah. Um, could you please uh, tell us uh, what is the thickness homogeneity of this material I'm over the active area? Over here. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and uh, maybe who is the manufacturer of uh, this material? So yeah, two questions. What is uh, the homogeneity, the thickness homogeneity of the material over the active area, the area which is stretched, and uh, maybe who is the manufacturer of this material? Uh, I can. The thickness is. If you're talking about the PM, is one. Yes, speak in the microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry. The th the thickness runs from one to. Well, we oh. use from one to two hundred microns. Yeah, my question was um, because usually manufacturing these very thin scintillators is quite tricky to make a homogeneous thickness. It used to be that you have uncertainty in the thickness at least 20%, sometimes even worse. Oh, yeah. If you ask about uniformity, uh, we've, we've at least measured over limited samples and, and seen no evidence, uh, both in terms of measuring with um, micrometers and also in terms of light yield. So we, we scanned our sources over large areas and don't see any evidence of certainly nothing like, you know, 20% would be a huge effect on our signal, and we don't see that. Okay, so it's less than a micrometer, for sure, much less. Yeah. Okay, and, and uh, could you say who is the manufacturer of this uh, material? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I might could, but then I'd be killed, so. <laughs> Okay, is there any other question? 
Otherwise, uh, we can th thanks Daniel again to show a very interesting uh, scintillator.